Bene, benvenuti a tutti, grazie per essere qui con noi questa sera, siamo, siamo davvero molto emozionate. Salutiamo anche chi ci seguirà poi in differita. Eh, come dicevo, siamo emozionatissime per questa serata con il professor Mark Beckhoff, dedicata alla presentazione del suo nuovo libro Dogs Demystified, an A to Z Guide to All Things Canning. Per chi di voi non ci conosce, noi siamo Benessere Cinofilia, ci occupiamo di formazione professionale e divulgazione teorica e pratica online e in presenza. Abbiamo Abbiamo sede nella provincia di Treviso ma grazie anche alle opportunità che internet ci offre siamo più vicini a tutti voi in ogni provincia italiana e anche a coloro che ci seguono da oltre confine. E, e questa meravigliosa avventura che Cristina, Laura, Elena e io stiamo vivendo grazie e insieme a tutti voi ci permette questa sera di poter intervistare una delle personalità di um, maggior spicco all'interno del panorama cinofilo mondiale. È infatti collegato con noi, come ben sapete, il professor Mark Beckhoff. Mark Beckhoff è biologo, etologo, ecologista comportamentale e scrittore americano. È professore emerito di ecologia e biologia evoluzionistica presso l'Università del Colorado e ha cofondato il Jane Goodall Institute of Ethologist for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. E, ragazzi, ha un curriculum lunghissimo a cui dovrei dedicare troppo spazio di questa serata per leggerlo, invece so che tutti voi, noi comprese, non vediamo l'ora di ascoltarlo. Io adesso passo quindi con immensa gioia la parola al professor Beckhoff che ci introdurrà in questa prima parte della serata il suo nuovo libro. Io ringrazio ancora tantissimo il professore per questa opportunità, ringrazio tutti voi per essere qui con noi questa sera e a nome di tutto lo staff di Benessere Cinofilia vi auguro un buon ascolto e una buona serata. Ok, here we go. You, it's hard to see. Um, oh, well. <laughs> well, yes, uh, it's one to one with the background. The... Yeah. It, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, I just discovered that it will be available probably around Christmas time in Italy. It's being translated now. So you'll just have to wait and it'll be, I hope it'll be your Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Or read it in English. <laughs> or, or read it. Yes, I yes, I can't read Italian, but um I rode with I did a long bike bike cycling ride today, and I think my friend said I'm supposed to say something like see Serata Bellissima or something like that. <laughs> Serata Bellissima. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um so do you want me to talk? I'm not quite sure. You have questions here. So um how do we want to do this? Vogliamo iniziare noi a fargli un po' di domande qui? Yes, ok. Ok, so we start so with some questions, yeah. Oh, so, oh, it's up to you. Any, anything, I'm, I'm sitting on my couch looking at the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> ok, your new book is really very interesting. Let's start our interview. Il testo è un dizionario completo a cui, come dice nella parte finale del libro, ha pensato per decenni. Nonostante questo, dopo la stesura, ha pensato, caspita, avrei voluto inserire anche questa parola? The text of the book is a complete dictionary that, as you say in the final part of the book, you have thought about decades. Despite this, after the writing, have you ever thought, oh, I wish I would have included that word too? Um, yeah, I, th I think what happened when I, when I was writing the book is that it got very long, very fast. <laughs> And I wasn't allowed to add anything, but my editor said that I could remove material if I wanted to. Um, So no, I mean, I'm not a dog trainer, so I could have had a little more in there on training methods, but then people would think that I'm that I'm a trainer, which I, which I'm not. I when I have problems with my dog, I would call a trainer and they would laugh, but <laughs> I had no idea what I, I I had no idea how to stop them from doing something or teach them um to do something. So no, I mean, you know, I'm sure there were some things that I could have added, but it in, in English, we would say it was a labor of love, and it it almost became a labor of, I don't want to say hate, but not love. Um, it was it was hard to put together. It, there's a lot of material in there, and 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 some people don't know, but all the references are on my homepage. 
um, if you go to markbeckoff.com. And, and that's turned out to be really good because you can just highlight or copy what you want and paste it into your web browser. Um, and there's a couple of, there's probably 500 there, but there were many more, but I, I didn't want to be um, guilty of killing people. <laughs> so <laughs> I think all the information is there. So anyway, well, and I appreciate your having me on your show. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Yes. Grazie mille. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nei suoi viaggi e nei suoi studi ha notato delle differenze nel modo di vivere il cane, non solo ovviamente tra le diverse parti del mondo, perché quello è abbastanza evidente, ma anche all'interno di quella che potremmo chiamare per intenderci cultura occidentale. During your travels and studies, did you notice any differences about the way people leave dogs? I mean, not just between different parts of the world, because it is quite obvious, but did you notice any differences also within what we might call the Western culture? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I, I always say that all dogs are individuals and humans are individuals and all dog-human relationships are very unique. I mean, they, they'll all have similarities, but but they are unique. So, so yeah, you know, like anything else, um, a lot of humans are control freaks. They just want to control everything in their life, including their dog. And there's there's no individual easier, if you will, to control than, say, you know, uh, your dog. Probably cats are more difficult to um, control. So there are differences. There are people who give their dogs a lot of freedom. Um, and there's people who control them like they're robots. So there are differences there. Um, I always tell people that they should, I, I, th I think I, one of my books is called Unleashing Your Dog in English. And I think it's called li li Libere, Libere, how do you say it? Um, it's called Freedom in, in Italian. Somebody tell yeah, me how to- It's like Libera. Libera, thank you. Libertà, okay. freedom, uh, libertà. Libertà. Okay, I'll be I'll be fluent at the end of this. Um, so um, so yeah, I mean, and and I think it's a really great question because one of the main messages in my book is that dogs are all individuals. You know, people will get the same type of dog, the same breed, <clears throat> excuse me, the same mix, and they'll get upset because they'll say, "Well, my new dog isn't like my old dog," and you know. What do I think? And what I think is that they ought to get re they ought to realize that all dogs are individuals. Um, but it's also a good question simply because there's no one there's there's no one way in my eyes to train or teach a dog to do something or not to do something. So the the main message there is that all dogs are individuals with very unique personalities, and that and even for the same dog because I lived with a lot of dogs when I lived in the mountains and they, they were very free. I mean, they'd never had leashes or collars on them and all their, you know, at any one time I could have five or six dogs at my house and they'd sleep and they'd play and they'd, they try to get me to feed them all the time because they, they liked good food and stuff like that, but they were all unique. But the other important message, you know, in, in the book, this book and other books is that, Like people, dogs can have good and bad days. You know, they can have headaches, they can have nightmares, they can have bad dreams. You know, they might ask another dog out on a date or to go to dinner and, and they say no, and then they get upset. <laughs> so you, 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 you really don't know. So the important message there is that what works for one dog may not work for another and what works on Monday for one dog may not work on Tuesday. And It surprised me how many people didn't didn't realize that they just thought the dog, you know, this uh, and I'll just say it right now, because this bears on some more myths that dogs are unconditional lovers, which they're not. And people would say, well, my dog is supposed to love me no matter what I do. And then I go usually, oh, I'm glad I'm not your dog. 
but 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 I but I don't say that to people because I'm a nice guy. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's lots of differences, and I think people really need to um, they need to acknowledge that. Yeah, even within breeds, breeds don't necessarily guarantee a stereotyped um, image, if you will. Yeah. Okay, thank you. La terza domanda è una domanda veramente difficile perché il libro è pieno di parole chiave. Ma se dovesse scegliere i tre vocaboli più importanti, quali sceglierebbe e perché? We have a really difficult question because the book is full of keywords. But if you were asked to choose the three most important words, which words would you choose and why? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because because last week I, I, I write for psychology today, and the three words I would use, um, there's a lot more, but you only ask for three, so that's all you're gonna get until you unless you ask me for more. Um, but the three words I would choose would be consent, um, agency or choice, and context. And the reason I would choose those words is because, you know, once again, sometimes people look at me like I'm crazy when I say, um, does your dog agree with what you are asking of them? Does your dog consent with what you're asking? And they'll go, oh, I never thought about that. And once again, I'll say, good, I'm glad I'm not your dog. But, um, but, but people really need to know that dogs have a point of view. They, you know, they have a perspective on life and they may agree on Monday to do something, but on Tuesday they may not. So consent is really important. And, you know, part of consent is to really know dog behavior. You know, I write a lot about being fluent in dog, um, being dog literate, for example. And far too many people who choose to live with a dog or not. Um, but if you want to have a good relationship with a dog or or you know or a human being at least, make it make it 50-50, you know, we'll say make it a two-way street. Um, and there's sometimes you won't, I think there's a Rolling Stones song, you won't, you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Um, and and with dogs, it's the same thing. You know, you might not get what you really want, but Maybe there's a good reason. Maybe they have an upset stomach. Maybe they had a bad dream. Maybe they got rejected by their boyfriend or girlfriend or somebody. And, and they just don't want to do what you want to do. So give them the freedom to make a choice. Um, and that would, you know, that blends into agency, which basically means give, giving um, an individual a choice, letting them have some control over their lives. Um, and so, and context is really important. Um, I think I use that word a lot in the book because what context means is taking into account um, who an individual dog is, um, regardless of whether they're a member of a breed or not, um, who they are, um, where they are, who else is around, include, you know, for maybe free ranging or feral dogs, you don't really have to worry about the humans. Um, but who's around? Who's are they friendly dogs or not friendly dogs? Um, where something is happening? Because because I'm really trained in ethology, and that's really studying wild animals. So so I studied wild coyotes for nine eight and a half years in 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 a big park in Wyoming, the state of Wyoming. And I studied penguins in Antarctica and people go, oh, they're all the same. No, they're not. They don't even all look the same when you spend time with them, although from a distance they do. So that's really important because, you know, with respect to dogs, you always hear that a particular dog is um, more well behaved when they're off leash than when they're on a leash. Um, nobody's really studied that with any detail, but I hear it all the time and I and I believe that. So is your dog tethered, we would say, 
Um, if they're on a leash, they have lost their freedom to to run around, to run, to uh, to approach um, something or someone who they really want to approach or to run away from them. And and I know that I I don't like being leashed. It would change my personality really um, greatly. So are they leashed? Are they home? Um, are they in a familiar place? Are they with familiar dogs or strange dogs or humans? Um, in, in ethology, for many animals, there's a phenomenon called the residency effect. And what that really refers to is that when you're on your home territory or when you're in your home, you're, you may feel stronger, bolder. And when you're away, you may feel more insecure. You may not feel safe. That would be the word I would use. So context is really important because, you know, people will say to me, oh, my dog has never done that. You know, when they jump on you or they hump your leg or they bump you or bite you. I don't, number one, I don't believe the dog has never done it, but it's a good excuse for people to say, oh, but my dog has never done that. But assuming that the dog hasn't done that, um, doesn't matter. They may find your leg or your your head or your hand something they want to jump on or bite. So those would be the three words. I'm I'm avoiding the words like aggression and alpha and dominant, although they're really important because dogs can be all do all you know. They can be dominant. They could be aggressive, and they there are alpha dogs. But gosh, when I say that to some people, I think they're going to beat me up. Um, so, because they get really offended, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. I could probably outrun them at least <laughs> if they catch me. Um, so anyway, that's, that's a great question. I'm going to write an article about that and I'll give you all credit, but are there three different words you can come up with that would really be, um, important, but, but I think context, consent, and choice would be the three the three C's. Yeah. Thank you. We have really a lot to think about. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, you, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Next question. Okay. Qual è secondo lei la sfida più grossa che dovranno affrontare i cani nei prossimi decenni? In your opinion, what could be the biggest challenge that dogs will face in the coming decades? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question too. Uh, well, the first would be too many humans. I mean, there's too many of us now, so. <laughs> oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> you know, so so too many humans. But, but it's really a good question too. I mean, in the sense that, um, I mean, there's a lot going on now in the world of animals, you know, not only for dogs and cats and companion animals, but um, there's just there's just a lot of animals out there. There's a lot of people out there, and a lot of people get feel really alienated from nature. And I think that's for some of my friends, and 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 people are just too stressed. They just you know running. A, i don't know, you probably have the same phrase in Italian, but they're running around like a chicken without their head or something, because that's what chickens without their heads do. But I think that that's going to spill over into how we interact with dogs. And a couple of months ago, I wrote an article with three people, um, one in Italy, Marco Ada, who studies dogs in Bali. And, and, and the tone of the article was, can humans keep, sorry, Can dogs keep up with increased human stress? And I don't know. And the reason it's a good question, because with some of my friends too, they it just seems they're stressed all the time. And and their dogs pay the price. The dogs don't get the walk they want. They don't get to go to the dog park. They don't get to go on match.com and find a date for the weekend. I mean, I don't know what they're not allowed to do, but 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 the people are really um, not giving the dogs what they need um, because they're more stressed. And I think that's going to be a huge problem. Another problem, I'll be honest with you, and I pulled out this list, is one of the things I try to do 
in the book is to dispel or do away with myths. Okay. And and the re, and one problem, I'm just going to say it, and I hope nobody gets, well, I don't think any of you will get offended, um, is that there's too many people writing about dogs who don't know dogs. I mean, I, I know people who write about dogs, and the only dogs I've ever seen are home dogs or dogs at a dog bar, park or dogs on a leash. They've never studied free-ranging dogs. They've never studied feral dogs. And, and I'm not saying that arrogantly. But 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 you can't base dog behavior on a home dog living in the middle of Rome or Turin or New York City or Denver, Colorado. Um, and I think that they're going to face that. I mean, I get, you know, I get articles and books to review that. Sorry, I'm just going to say it are terrible. The people don't know dog behavior. Um, so I think that that's going to be a big problem. Um, and. And the other big problem, of course, is all the people who use negative reinforcement and beat dogs up or give, you know, treat them like their their chair or their couch. Because if you want to get a dog or a human to do something, you can do that by mistreating them. But number one, it's ethically wrong. It's just wrong to do that. But I think what's happening now, and, I've, and I, I love this question because I think what's happening now is more and more people have dogs because of the pandemic and more and more people want dogs because they have such crappy lives. They think the dogs are going to be their prescription drug, which, which they're not. I mean, they certainly shouldn't be treated that way. Um, and also just because people are too stressed and they have, and they have short tempers. I, I really have thought a lot about that in the paper I wrote with Marco and two women in um, in England made me made me really think about that. And some of my friends, their dogs are really suffering because the people are so highly stressed. I don't know if that's where you wanted me to go with it, but that's <laughs> that's where I wound up. <laughs> um, um, I mean, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I mean, it's funny because on my bike ride, I was talking to a friend of mine. <laughs> And 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 that's what I came out with this morning, that you got to be really selective in what you read about dog behavior and dog training. You 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 just have to be. And and negative trainers or people who beat dogs and yell at them and hit them should be should lose. Well, in the United States, you don't have to be licensed to do it. I don't believe you have to in Italy either. Can, I mean, can't anybody just be a dog trainer or not? I don't know. Serve una licenza per essere. No, in, in pratica, no. No, you can do also without. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. You need it to practice. So you have to, to study and to yeah. it's very difficult to, to practice. But uh, as I know, uh, it's not um, uh, the law. Mandatory. Mandatory. Yeah. Obligatory. Yes. Hmm. Yes, that's well, a pity. That's a pity. It's a it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. I I understand. Yeah, I mean, in the United States, anybody can be a dog trainer. You could just walk out tomorrow and say and hang a shingle, you know, a, sh a sign up and say, "I'm a dog trainer." I mean, I mean, I'd be <laughs> the the one dog trainer I work with closely in Boulder, a woman named Mary Angeli. I mean, she's She's got a, you know, she's got all the degrees you need from college. Plus, she's a fully certified, force-free, positive trainer. Um, but I, I mean, and I never really interacted with trainers much, except like I said, when I needed a trainer, and there was a woman in Boulder who would come up and go, "You need a trainer," <laughs> and I'll go, "I need a trainer. I don't know how to how to stop my dog from doing something." Um, because I didn't know the dog. I, you know, fost I had rescued him and you know he was he was it, it was my last one of my last dogs and he was a character, but um but um I th I think that you know I tying that into you know the big problem, I, I I do think that's a problem. I recently was asked to review a book on dog behavior, and 
it, it just had things all wrong. You know, it said, if a dog barks, it means this. If a dog growls, it means this. If a dog does something, it means that. Ignoring, say, context, um, for, for example, ignoring context. Um, but, you know, there's just so many myths out there about dog behavior that they're unconditional lovers. They're not, we're not their best friends. It sells a lot of books to say our best friends, but dog abuse is rather high, far too high. Um, dog, you know, dogs live in the present. You know, people like to say dogs are Zen dogs. And no, they don't. They have memories of what happened. I mean, how in the world do you train a dog if they don't have memories of what they're, they've learned? Um, they anticipate the future, you know? I mean, I didn't need to pick a leash or a collar up when I lived in the mountains, but my dogs could read me like a book. And if I was sitting at a, on a couch or at my desk and I started, you know, say if I had a pen in my hand and I'd go tapping it because I was totally lost in what I was writing. I had no idea what I was going to be doing next. But I realized that two of them knew that when I tapped my pen like this, it was a walk or a run. <laughs> and so they would be looking at me. And the minute I would pick my pen up, one of them would run to the door of my office because I had a lot of land. And he'd be going <laughs> like that. Come on, Mark, get out of that damn chair. Let's go. <laughs> Um, so that's another myth. But but the reason I think it harms dogs and all these myths harm dogs is because people develop expectations. They'll read a book and said, if your dog barks, it means this. If you bought, you know, if your dog barks excessively, it means this. And I they asked me and I, I don't know if you, you know, if you remember in the book. Dogs don't bark excessively. Usually what happens is they're barking because something's bothering them or they're trying to get your attention. So, so once again, you know, getting back to context, there's always a reason they're doing something. I, they're not, you know, the other is that dogs always are trying to manipulate us. You know, I know people who it's more about the people than the dogs, you know, they'll say, Oh, my dog is trying to manipulate me and, and wants food and he's using me or she's using me. What do you think? What I really think is you should go see a psychologist immediately, but I can't, I can't say that to people. Um, but what I really think it's because people don't understand dog behavior because they read an article that said, if your dog barks too much, then don't give them food. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to go on and on about this, but I, but that's the reason I wrote the book was really to see if dog, if people could become dog fluent and, and dogs have to become human fluent in some ways. You know, they don't have to learn Italian and Spanish and English and German and Hungarian, but they but they read us really well. And a lot of the gestures and movements we make cross across cultural. And so dogs have to read us. Yes, <laughs> you're right. Dogs are doing it. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Ricorda un momento preciso in cui hai deciso, ok, questo è quello che voglio studiare e fare nella mia vita? Do you remember the moment you decided, ok, this is what I want to study and live my life? <coughs> Excuse me, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, it's very dry here. Um, yeah, oh, that okay. happened when I, I think that happened right when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. In the meantime, I was born in the meantime. I mean, my, 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 my parents tell me that from the time I could walk or crawl, I would always seek out the, the neighborhood dogs and cats, and I would talk to them and the birds and m m mice and, and insects. Um, but really, I, I, I mean, you know, once again, I mean, I just never thought I never, th I never had the thought that other animals, and mo most of them were dogs and cats, but, but I had a, uh, there was a squirrel I really liked. So, you know, and I didn't know at the time whether a dog and a cat were, I didn't know the difference between dogs and cats and squirrels other than they all ran around on four legs and, and I was too. So, um, but, but, you know, I never doubted that they had really, feelings I, I was always asking my parents what are 
what are these animals thinking and what are they feeling? And I wrote a book called Minding Animals in English. I know it came out in Italian recently, but I, I, I was looking for my copy and I wouldn't want to even try to, yeah, I don't know where it is, but it came out in Italian. Um, and they said, I was always minding animals, which meant that um, in, I was minding them in terms of being concerned about their well-being and minding, you know, and I was minding them by um, attributing active brains and minds to them. And, and most people thought I was like crazy because well, 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 my parents were crazy. Well, we were probably all were a little crazy, but not because of the dogs and the cats, but, but they never, they always supported me. And when I was about three years old, I yelled at a man for hitting his dog. And the guy started up with my father. And afterwards, my father said, I don't think that that's a good idea. Because <laughs> the guy wasn't going to, you know, yell at me. But, um, but I, but I've always felt for me, my mother was a very empathic woman. And I was a tip, I, and I, I, I always used to apologize to her for being a tip, a, a difficult teenage boy. <laughs> but she said, whatever. <laughs> she still loved me. But, um, but my mother was a real empathic woman, and I think that that happened. Um, that that was important as well. Um, but I never doubted. I, I really never doubted. I, I, I used to cut classes at school all the time because I just didn't like being inside. But the classes I would miss were the dissection classes. Um, you, and, and the reason was I wasn't trying to be nasty. It, it just didn't feel right. I, 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 and, and, and really, to this day, I, I'm, I'm sure there's maybe you all and plenty of people who are listening. Um, I can feel the joy and pain of these animals. I mean, I can, I, I can feel the happiness of a dog you know, who sees their friends and they want to go play or sniff their butts or do something. I can feel their happiness. And I can also feel their sadness when they're when when they don't feel safe. Safety is a huge thing. I mean, it's a huge thing for humans too, but I, I would never try to write a book called Humans Demystified because I mean, we're just so mysterious and stuff like that. I won't go into that. That's just another, that's another book down the way. But, um, but, um, but, you know, I, I you can, f I don't know, I'm sure you can. I, I can feel their indecision. Yeah, I can feel when they're uncertain. Um, but, but, you know, the joy and happiness they feel when they're with friends or doing something that's maybe not human appropriate, but dog appropriate. And the sadness when when they miss a friend or they they have an expectation. My dogs, um, there were dogs who used to come down every day because their human lived in the mountains above me, and my dogs would just wait for Zeke and Maddie to drive up the driveway. They didn't drive, by the way, but or to be driven up my road. And when they came, it was just, I mean, it, there was no word for it, and I would just sit there like this. And my friend Pam, who brought the dogs down, would say, well, but you've seen that before. And I said, I could see this, <laughs> given the state of the world sometimes, I could see this 24 hours a day and still feel the joy of those dogs. The reason I say that is, once again, is I think there's a lot of people who get dogs and don't have any appreciation at all for the deep emotional lives of these animals and, and that they're sentient beings with really deep feelings. They can be hurt like we can be hurt. You know, another dog could say something to them or do something and it can make them feel really uncomfortable or, and hurt them. Or, or, or once again, they, they, can, they can just feel love and connection and in an uninhibited dog way. Um, so, I know that it's a long way of answering that question, but but I actually think there's a lot of people who have been um, taught to suppress their feelings, not only for dogs, but for people. And I think that that's just the wrong way. To, I mean, I, I could never, I personally could never live that way. And most of the people in my life could never live that way. So 
it's maybe in your DNA and you don't feel inhibited of, of, of crying when something happens or smiling when you see dogs playing. I don't, does, does that make sense? Is that translatable? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, I think I decided, my mother decided that I probably decided to do what I was doing before I was born. <laughs> before. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't answer that question. <laughs> anyway. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Professor oh, well. Becker. Yeah, that was really emotional. And I think that empathy is uh, really a keyword like your mother had with you. And like uh, we have, we need to have with our dogs or animals. And you also talked about happiness. So we go deep on that now. Mm -hmm. uh, All'interno del libro, c'è una piccola sezione dedicata alle domande che molte persone vorrebbero fare ai loro cani. Abbiamo quindi pensato di raccogliere anche noi attraverso un questionario compilato da coloro che si sono iscritti a questa serata. Abbiamo riscontrato che la domanda più frequente che molti di voi fareste al loro cane è se appunto il loro compagno a quattro zampe è felice. Se è felice e con le varie declinazioni. Se è felice, cosa posso fare di più? Sei felice? Sto rispettando la tua alterità? È in assoluto la domanda che è più uscita dal questionario. Within the book, there is a, a little section dedicated to the questions that many people would like to ask to their dogs. For this reason, we also thought about collecting some questions through an online survey that many of you that are with us tonight have filled out. We found that uh, the question which most of you would like to ask to your dogs uh, is whether their four-legged friend uh, is happy. Happy with all its forms. Are you happy? What could I do more for you? Are you happy? Am I respecting your otherness? Mm. This is by far the most asked question in the survey. Yeah, I, I love that. And that's what, mo I mean, that's what a lot of people um, in the book, um, if you, you know, look for synonyms or words that mean the same as happy, are you content? Um, am I, am, um, are you, uh, uh, am I giving you a good life? I know, I, I, I love knowing that of, of people because um, sometimes you don't feel that when you see people with their dogs, you know, they're, they're yanking them down the street, you know, a dog is sniffing or looking around or, you know, their ears are going all over the place because they're trying to locate a sound and the human goes, well, come on, there's nothing there. And of course the dog doesn't know what the human is saying other, maybe the tone of the voice is saying, let's go. And the dog is saying, oh, there's, what do you mean there's nothing there? There's everything there. <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to sniff this odor. I want to know what Harry was doing this morning or Mary was doing this morning and what they had for breakfast or, <laughs> or, or I hear something and I want, you know, want to locate it. And, and once again, you know, that's just, I mean, when I say to me, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's to all of you too. Um, that's kind of, the test, you know, for the, the nature of the dog human relationship is whether people are patient enough to let the dog exercise their body and in unleashing your dog, um, exercise their senses, you know, and, and, you know, in all honesty, I, I, I rarely was personally faced with that because the dogs I lived with and the dogs who came to my house during the day, they either were dropped off or they came down, um, down a, a dirt road from the higher up in the mountains. Um, they were free to do it, anything they wanted. And, and I, I actually think, and once again, I, I, maybe people have studied this in humans, but I, I don't find humans, but I mean, I find certain humans to be interesting, but as a species, I don't think we're doing all that well. But um, but but there's a real correlation between feeling free and safe and being happy and content. 
And I, my general feeling, and and maybe you all and other people in the audience know better, more than I do, but I just think when dogs, dogs appreciate being allowed to be dogs. They don't sit down and write a book saying, this is what I want, um, mainly because, because they can't. <laughs> But but if you know dog behavior, you know, you just watch them and you can see, are they content? You know, do they look nervous? I mean, you, we all know what the nervous and we, we all can differentiate, choose, um, know, know the difference between a nervous dog and a content dog, for example, a happy dog. But that, to me, that should be the goal of every single interaction, dog, human, well, human dog, human cat, human human, human spider, I don't really care, you know, who the non-human is, is to respect their otherness. I, I that word is really important um in there because they are other than than I and you, but but you're other than I as human beings. And I I mean to me, the easiest way to live is just is let other people express themselves. Don't try to control them. And, 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 if, and if you can get along, fine. If you can't, fine. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but like, I mean, I'm, I have enough trouble sometimes controlling myself. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I don't want somebody telling me what to do all the time. I don't mind people suggesting things, but I wouldn't want to have a leash around a collar around my neck with somebody yanking me here and there. Or if I stop, um, it's, I'm a very slow walker, and I always have been. And people say, come on, and I'll go, well, be my guest. Just keep walking. I'll, I'll find you. You know, I don't have any much of a sense of direction, so I might get lost, but that's okay. I'll, I'll find you at some point. But think of what dogs are putting up with. They're always looking up at you. They're being yanked along. They're being told, come on, there's nothing there. They're not allowed to sniff to their heart's content and they need exercise. Um, and, I, 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 and, and some people have told me, and once again, I think you all and people in your audience might, you know, not might, you, you like me to know better than I do, but I don't feel that dogs are taking, trying to take advantage of me when they're ball, you know, when, I mean, I, I've so rarely walked a dog on a leash um, but you know, when they're doing something that, that pisses me off that I don't think they're doing it intentionally to make me upset. They're just, they're being a dog people. I mean, my God, people do it all the time. <laughs> so, you know, give, give the dog the credit for not doing what you want them to do, but not because they're trying to upset you. And I, you know, the reason I think that's huge is because I hear a lot of people. And once again, I'm not a dog trainer. So you and you and people in, um, who are kind enough to be here today, I mean, you probably hear that all the time. Yeah, my dog did that to make me upset. Well, I don't think so. I mean, they could. I mean, they could do that, but that's not the that's not sort of the rule of the road. You know, that, that that's that's not kind of like you know what they're paid to do. I, I do think in at some very deep level. Dogs would like to please us, but not because they're subordinate. It's just, it feels better. I mean, I, I always tell people, doesn't it feel better to be with people who respect you and you respect? I mean, hello? You know, I mean, and and so I don't see, do you know, dogs are mammals. We're mammals. We have the same type of brain. We have the same neurotransmitters. So I don't think they're trying to use us. Um, but I do think that, if everybody, if everybody really worked hard um, to give dogs a good life and to be happy, the world would be a lot better for humans and for dogs. Um, but yeah, and, and yeah, I don't know. I, I I was pleased to read that question this morning, Eleanor, because it would it just I, I think. I think that's, we owe it to dogs. Maybe I would look at it that way. I mean, when I say we, I don't mean you, all of us, but, you know, we made dogs who they are. You know, we bred dogs who can't breathe, who can't breed, who can't give birth on their own. 
we we bred all these you know fifth, you know varieties of dogs and and so we made them who they are in many ways so we owe it to them as a member of the human if you will the human species to give them the best life possible thanks so much it was really it were really precious work for us well thank you i love your quite i love the question and i was <laughs> i was reading it this morning because the, the the guy i rode with today was a bike racer and lived in italy so he knows italian oh uh, cool <laughs> yeah so so he said oh do you have the questions in italian and i went yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> but someday i need to be I, i need to learn italian but but that's great news i really um i, I think that it's not surprising because i can I, i know some of the people who are listening to you today who, who are listening to us today um and they all want their dogs to be happy so thank you very much <laughs> okay abbiamo raccolto anche raggruppandole un po' di domande dirette al professor beckhoff da parte dei nostri iscritti We also grouped some direct questions to Professor Beckhoff from many of you. La prima è, qual è a suo avviso l'aspetto più importante da tenere in considerazione più di tutti nella relazione con il proprio cane? The first one, the first question is, in your opinion, what is the most important aspect to take into consideration above all in the relationship with your dog? The most important, I know, I'm I'm not a most or a least person, so. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the one, I mean, to me, the most important thing that you could take into account, or that you need to take into account in your relationship with a dog, a cat, a rabbit, an ant, or another person, is that you're dealing with a sentient being. You're, you're, you're dealing with a person who has feelings. They have rich emotions. They have deep feelings and you don't have to please them all the time, but you should never intentionally harm them. I, I mean, I really, maybe that's being simplistic, but, um, you know, and we've all, you know, we've all done and said things that we wish we didn't say or do. So no one's perfect in that sense. But, but I think um, when you're dealing with a dog, you I, I I often say that, you know, we're their lifeline, we're their oxygen. I mean, we can lock them in a closet all day and they'll come out wagging their tail and people, you know, that unconditional lover lie. They'll come out and wag their tail and lick you and they'll go, see, my dog still loves me. What do you think? And I said, I, I usually say, you don't want to know what I think. <laughs> so, so don't ask, please. Um, but but I think when when you realize that you're dealing with another individual who's got feelings like you do, it doesn't mean that they feel the same about things as you do. It doesn't mean that their joy and their grief and their pleasure and their whatever it is, is the same as yours, but they have it. And we need to honor that they may feel love, they may feel aggression, they may feel, you know, and say negative and positive emotions differently but they have them and if, and just because they don't express them the way you do doesn't mean that they don't have them and i i find that to be i mean to me that's a very simple thing am i perfect doing it i think i've gotten better over the years but but you know there's just no reason to intentionally harm to intentionally harm or demean or degrade another human there's just no reason to do it And it takes and it takes time and energy. I mean, I'd rather be with people who make me feel good and I can make them feel good. And I or, you know, I'd rather sit on my couch and do nothing and drink a glass of wine than go out and try to find somebody to to berate or beat up. I mean, you know, I don't mean physically, but because it takes too much energy. So I think sentient. So I think sentience is really um is is really one of the key variables um that we need to recognize in in dogs and other be and other animal beings okay thank you so uh la seconda domanda 
qual è stata la sua gioia più grande nel rapporto con gli animali? So the, the second question is, what was your greatest joy in your relationship with animals? Oh God, it's once again the greatest. It's the best or the only. <laughs> um, one of, one of. Uh... <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Is um, being accepted by them. You know, just because I did, I did eight and a half years of field work on wild coyotes. And in the, you know, we, we saw wolves and we worked with bears and cougars, mountain lions, was just having them accept me. You know, they, that they weren't afraid of me. I wasn't giving them, I wasn't causing them to be, feel unsafe or fear, for example. Um, and and when I studied penguins in Antarctica, I mean, they didn't know who we were. We, I was with a group of three people and, the penguins we were studying had probably never seen a human being and it was their summer. So it was nice weather, but it was still cold. And we were wearing big jackets and, you know, wool hats. And, and all I could think about is they're sitting there going, who are these? They wouldn't say people, but, but who are these things who are running around and looking at us and counting our eggs and watching us, you know, like we were voyeurs or we were trespassing into their lives. But once again, applying it to dogs just more directly because, you know, have, having more contact with them was simply, is simply um, having them accept me, having them allow me to be, to be a member of their, their social, the world say, you know, and 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 what what comes from that, of course, is that once again the um, the inference that they feel safe with you, they tr trust. Trust is is the is the big word. You know, they they trust that you have their best interests in mind. I would like to trust that they have my best interests in mind, and I would like to trust that other people have their best interests and in, my best interests in mind. And that if they want to screw around with me, they'll just leave me alone. I, I just don't have time for that in my life. So, so the word trust is really important. Um, and, and what it means to me, like with dogs or other animals, is that somehow it's not always, it's not always so apparent. I'm, I'm behaving in a way that indicates to them that they can feel safe and that they can trust me, you know, that I'm not going to harm them. So, so, so trust and safety to me are really key elements in um, developing a long-term, a, a strong and mutually beneficial um, relationship. So, yeah. Yeah, as you say at the beginning, maybe trust and safety can be something related also to uh, a dog, a dog, or another. So different dog are different uh, kind of trust for people uh, and behave differently. And I, it could be like this. Yeah. So do you mean trust between dogs? No, the way a dog trusts a people, uh, a person. So maybe my dog trusts. Uh, uh, me in a way and maybe your dog trusts me in a different way oh absolutely because that speaks to the that each dog is an individual yeah i know i love what you just said and i love because that really what it means is that they're the dogs are able to assess you and i are different and um and the trust can be different but but I think part of trust is not is the safety and predictability. You know, you and I might have the same dog, but it doesn't mean that they interact with us in the same way. And it, and I think what you're saying, I totally agree with, is that they doesn't that that they don't expect it. You know, oh, Mark does this, Elena does this, you know, Christina does this, but that's all fine. But but to me, the bottom line there, and I think what you the point you're making is really important, is they trust us because they they know we're not we're, they know we're not going to harm them, we're not going to hurt them, 
They know we we respect them as individuals. We respect them as different individuals, and we respect that they have feelings and emotions and and that they're sentient. Yeah, I like what you just said because to me, so much of it comes down to to sentience. To me, it just comes down to that. Can you harm a dog and they'll still quote look like they love you? Sure, but they don't. <laughs> They're probably scared. You scare the hell out of them. And all they can say is, oh, my God, there's Mark or Eleanor or Christina or Joe. And I'm, I need to behave in a certain way or they're going to harm me again. They're going to beat me. They're going to yell at me. You know, they're going to whatever, make fun of me. So, yeah, good point. This okay. is great. I love I love learning. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the last question. Yep. Ultima domanda. Com'era il cane più intelligente e comunicativo che hai conosciuto? Ok, I will translate it, uh, but then I will change a little bit because I know that you don't like most or least. So the question no, that's is, okay. Italian, <laughs> is Italian, uh, how is or how was the most intelligent and communicative dog you ever met? So maybe not the most, but uh, can you describe it? Or like if we can imagine a Log, uh, which is uh, intelligent and communicative. Well, I was, it's funny because I made some notes here, which I can't read because my handwriting is so horrible. And I'm going, what did I write about an hour ago? Uh, I separate intelligence and, and, um, and, and, and communicative. Um, my last dog, Jethro, was pretty amazing. I, I, I rescued him. I, I don't know anything about him for his first nine, give or take nine months of life. Um, I, I think, I don't think he was abused, although he, he didn't like anybody, including me touching his front feet. And, and people would come in and, you know, he'd be laying down. He was a big dog and he was a friendly dog and his tail would be going like this. And they'd reach for his front feet and he'd jump up and growl. And the, I mean, one friend said, do you, do you think he would nip at me? And I said, yeah, I do. I think, you know, I think if you, but, but I don't like people coming up and touching my feet either. So what the hell? I mean, why, why? I mean, hello. <laughs> um, but um, he just seemed to have a knack. Um, I used to call him street smart, meaning that he just knew how to behave. And I think some of that and his, if you will, intelligence and his ability to communicate what he needed was from the fact that at least for a good part of his first nine months of life, he was on his own. He, he, was, he was from a small town east of Boulder. There were a few homes out there at the time. People, the, the, the people who lived there said they saw him for at least two weeks on his own. Um, And we don't know, you know, I, I didn't know, did he jump out of a car? Did he run away? Did somebody dump him out there and, you know, desert him? I don't know. But he could really, he could, he could do well with other dogs, other people, vastly different dogs and different people. And he never seemed to get upset. And he always seemed to be, um, He was street smart and he had social and emotional intelligence. I really felt that way. And he liked my food. M most of my dogs lived on burritos and pizza. I mean, because I'm vegan and so they didn't get any meat, but they loved like bagels with cream cheese and peanut butter. They loved rice and bean burritos. You know, people would go, oh, how could you feed them people food? And I'll go, hello? What, what do you mean? <laughs> you know? And, and what I liked was they didn't beg. They just knew they were going to get food, you know, but he, Jethro just, and, and there's other dogs. I know a couple of others, of course. Jethro just seemed to figure things out really fast. And I think it was because he was on his own. He was meeting different people. He was meeting different dogs. Maybe he met cats. Um, and, you know, maybe he met rabbits. In the mountains, there were bunnies running all over the place, and he never chased a bunny. He would just, you know, he would he would just lie down and look at them, and I would, and he, as if he was saying, "Oh, it's just another bunny, and there's no way in the world I'm going to catch them, so I'm just going to lie here and and appreciate them." Um, but there's lots of dog, lots of intelligent and um, communicative 
dogs. They're all individually wonderful. That's the way I feel about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we are at the end. We would really like to thank Mark Beckhoff. Thank you so much, Professor, for your kindness. It has been a pleasure for us to have you with us tonight. We will always carry your prestigious word with us. Grazie mille, Professor Beckhoff. Grazie di cuore per essere stato qui con noi questa sera e grazie per aver dato a benessere cinofilia l'onore di presentare il suo nuovo libro al pubblico italiano. <laughs> questa sera okay. resterà per sempre impressa nei nostri cuori. Grazie. I can say grazie mille, mille oh, oh you wonderful people. I need to get back to Italy. <laughs> I was telling I was telling my friend that. I, I love it. Do you see the reaction, the hearts? Oh my god, oh yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know what those were. <laughs> I mean, I knew they were hearts because I'm not those that are dumb. <laughs> the people from home that want to thank you. Oh well, thank you all for coming. I know. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, so many reactions. I, I, I don't know who yeah. Deborah Lee Ferrara. I, I mean, I was trying. I when I got home from my my cycling thing, I um I made a list of all the people because I had some what's up text from people who said that they would see me in an hour. <laughs> well, I would be glad to do this again. Thank you. No, really, this is great. The questions are great. You all are friendly. Um, and and I do need to get back to Italy. I know I was telling my friend who used to live there and race bikes, like, because I used to race bikes and I raced in France and other places. I never raced in Italy. And I, and, and I, I need to come back with a bicycle. <laughs> Yes, nice idea. <laughs> yeah, we we wait for you here, really. Where do you all Where do you all live? Where do you live, Christina? Well, at Treviso, near Venice. Yeah, near oh. Venice, in the north. And where Where um, are you? I'm in Genoa. Where? In Genoa. Oh, I near the sea. Yeah, I've been there. And where are you, Camilla? Oh, also Treviso, near yeah. Venice. Also and, near and, Treviso. Yeah, and that, I've never been to Venice. Is it nice? Yeah, yeah. You, should, you, should. you can come. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Maybe nice. next next spring. I, I no, I've been thinking about it because I, I wrote a book called The Emotional Lives of Animals, and I just um, I mean, just two weeks ago, I finished revising it and, and updating it, and um. And it and it was published in Italian in two different versions actually because the first trans I mean I couldn't tell but the first translation wasn't very good so I think how do you say it Hakin no the the publisher um, Hakiana 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 yeah so they published a second edition and they're actually translating a book I wrote um, called Wild Justice um, on the moral lives of animals and then they're coming and then they're doing this one okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry. okay. I, I may i may have to give in and travel again <laughs> I'm, i got really lazy <laughs> okay grazie a tutti per essere stati con noi vi ricordo di seguirci sui nostri profili social dove pubblichiamo tutti i giorni articoli, eventi e curiosità in tema cinofilo. Visitate anche il nostro sito www.benesserecinofilia.it nella sezione webinar eh, dove per, restare, per conoscere nel dettaglio eh, tutti i prossimi eventi formativi. Uh, it was uh, great uh, to be together tonight. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I encourage you and anybody else, if you have questions, send we, me an email. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. And uh, we will wait for you in Italy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm to gonna come. I... Well, Italy is, is unbelievable. Okay, <laughs> you have to see. Oh, I I you love Italy. Come. No, I, I do. I do. Well, thank you for thank you thank you for your interest in my work and for all the great questions and send you lots of blessings. Okay. And, and take care of yourselves. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. you.
Bye. Grazie a tutti. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Grazie a tutti, grazie. Ciao, alla Ciao. prossima. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao, Mark, Ciao. grazie. Grazie, bye grazie bye. mille. Bye bye. 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 bye.